I'm here at the corner of Mickey Avenue and Dopey Drive at the Walt Disney Studio in Burbank, California. Hi, I'm Leonard Malton. There are a lot of movie studios in Hollywood, but probably none has been made more familiar to a wider public audience than the Walt Disney Studios. Walt Disney's beginnings in Hollywood were somewhat less than glamorous. For several months after his arrival in the summer of 1923, he worked an animation camera in his uncle Robert's garage until he landed his first contract for the Alice in Cartoon Land shorts late that year. After briefly using the cramped back room of a real estate office nearby, Walt and his brother and business partner Roy, along with Ub Iwerks and a small staff, moved into a storefront at 4649 Kingswell Avenue in the Los Feliz neighborhood. Since the cartoon industry was centered in New York, the newly christened Disney Brothers Studio became the first animated cartoon studio in Hollywood. The success of the Alice comedy soon forced Walt and his staff out of the storefront and into larger space, in a converted organ factory east of Hollywood in the neighborhood of Silver Lake. Walt and Roy put a $400 deposit on the 40 by 60 foot lot and existing buildings located at 2719 Hyperion Avenue in January of 1926. When the Disney operation moved from Kingswell Avenue, it was renamed, changing from Disney Brothers Studio to the Walt Disney Studios. It was here that Mickey Mouse was born. The Silly Symphonies were created, and the pioneering feature-length cartoons Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Pinocchio, Fantasia, and Bambi were produced. It was also here that Walt discovered that people liked to see how Disney cartoons were made. In the summer of 1937, in response to requests from members of the RKO Radio Pictures staff to take a peek behind the scenes at the Walt Disney Studio, Walt and his staff cobbled together a promotional film titled A Trip Through the Walt Disney Studio. RKO was Walt's distributor at the time, and the film was intended to fire up the sales staff to build enthusiasm for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. This was the first time Walt had allowed an extensive studio tour to be filmed. RKO's response to A Trip Through the Walt Disney Studio was so strong that someone suggested adapting it for release to the public as a promotional trailer for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. You might even call it an early infomercial. Re-edited and retitled How Walt Disney Cartoons Are Made, this short included footage of the Hollywood premiere of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and was released to theaters nationwide in early 1938. The success of these behind-the-scenes shorts was something that Walt remembered a few years later, when the overwhelming success of Snow White dictated a move into new digs. You see, from 1926 to 1940, the Disney studio on Hyperion Avenue grew in fits and starts, with many hoped-for improvements hindered by the lack of available property. By the end of 1938, every available space at the small studio was filled with staff working on Fantasia and Pinocchio, along with the continuous release of cartoon shorts. The number of animators and storymen was so great that the boss rented an adjacent apartment building to house Fantasia development. The staff of Bambi had to be moved into office space at 861 North Seward Street in Hollywood, and the story research, training, promotion, engineering, and comic strip departments were moved to the second floor of a building near Hollywood and Vine. The astounding profits from the release of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs enabled Walt and Roy to explore a serious expansion of their tiny studio lot. Buying adjacent properties was briefly considered, but deemed impractical because of the nightmare of simultaneous production and construction. So the Disney brothers began looking for open land where they could build roomier facilities from scratch. They purchased a 51-acre site on the edge of Griffith Park in Burbank, not far from Warner Brothers Studios and the Columbia Pictures Ranch, and hired noted industrial designer Kem Weber to come up with a decorative scheme for the new state-of-the-art animation studio, and also design all the furniture to go with it. Frank Crowhurst, superintendent of construction for the new studio, remembered presenting Weber's innovative streamlined modern building designs to Walt. It's no good for me, Frank said, or anybody else trying to tell Walt how a building should look. He isn't interested. It's how he will use it that is the governing factor in every case. 
As Walt would say, give me the plans, the functions, intelligently laid out, then I don't care what you do after that, so long as you don't destroy those functions. What Walt got, at a cost of $3 million, was practically a small city. Paved streets with curbs, street lights, storm drains, and firefighting equipment were installed. Among the 21 original buildings was a 750-seat theater, three large recording stages, an animation building with room enough for 900 artists, vastly expanded parking, a service station, medical facilities, and carpentry, machine, and electric shops. Additionally, several buildings from the old Hyperion lot were moved intact to Burbank to house such departments as casting, accounting, and purchasing. Kem Weber configured the buildings into a well-ordered college campus atmosphere, unlike any in Hollywood, with an architectural design built around a plan of efficient production flow, functional architecture at its best. The major buildings on the lot conform to the assembly line of the animation process, with the large animation building, followed by the ink and paint building and paint lab, and continuing on to the camera and editing buildings. The animation building was the creative heart of the studio. Housing offices for the story department, directors, background painters, animators, and their assistants. The building was constructed in eight separate wings to accommodate the need for as many north-facing windows as possible for better light. This double H layout had the added benefit of helping to spread out the stress of any earthquakes. This original 1940 building withstood the tremors of the 1994 Northridge quake better than most of the newer buildings on the studio lot. It was also in this building that Walt Disney had his offices, up in a third floor corner suite. At the same time the Disney staff was moving to Burbank, just after Christmas of 1939, war in Europe was decimating Walt Disney's finances. He counted on income from foreign markets to fuel his upcoming projects, and now that market was cut off. Dumbo wouldn't be released until the fall of 1941, and Bambi wouldn't be ready until the following year. So Walt invented a low-budget feature film to keep the wheels turning and generate some much-needed cash. Remembering the response to those promotional shorts shot at the old studio a few years before, he and his staff created The Reluctant Dragon, which was released on June 20th, 1941. A handful of animated sequences, including the story that gives the film its name, were linked by footage of humorist and character actor Robert Benchley, taking a goofy tour of the Disney studio in pursuit of an audience with Walt. Along the way, Benchley, with us in tow, visits the sound effect stage, the paint department, a recording session with the voice of Donald Duck, the drawing board of legendary animator Ward Kimball, and a lot of Walt's sparkling new quarters. Bibbity. Bobbity. Ten years later, when Walt made his first foray into the infant medium of television, he again revisited the studio tour idea, bringing viewers behind the scenes on the making of Alice in Wonderland. It seemed clear that Walt felt comfortable in the studio setting. Within a few years, the sight of Walt and his studio environment became familiar to millions this with the debut the of his weekly TV program, Burbank, Disneyland. California. And directly over Mickey Avenue, the main thoroughfare of the studio. To all outward appearance, it's just another working day here. On the surface, things here appear to be following their normal pattern. But the truth of the matter is, something unusual is going on in the studio today. Something that never happened before. Here now to tell you about it is Walt Disney. Welcome. I guess you all know this little fella here. It's an old partnership. Mickey and I started out the uh, first time many, many years ago. We've had a lot of our dreams come true. Now we want you to share with us our latest and greatest dream. That's it, right here. Disneyland. Nearly every week, Walt greeted viewers from settings meant to evoke or recreate offices and other locales on his Burbank lot. 
The furnishings in Walt's actual offices were copied for the set that he often used for lead-ins to his television show. The view from his office set's windows was in fact a painted backdrop, but in a surreal continuity flaw, the backdrop showed the very animation building he was supposedly standing in. Walt didn't remain in his office every week. He traveled throughout the studio, showing off all manner of departments, functions, and locales. Some of these included the music department, the ink and paint department, effects animation, the camera department, the multiplane camera, and of course animators hard at work on the latest Disney features. The department for storage of art had long been referred to by studio employees as the morgue, so that's exactly the way it was presented in a 1957 TV episode. Don't be alarmed. Appearances can be deceiving, even in a morgue. Let's look at things in a different light. See, just a storage room. Even our late lamented friend here is nothing more sinister than a table of photographs ready to be filed away. And Mr. Bones over there, well, he's a, an animation model for the art school. You know, morgue in the newspaper business means a place where they keep used but usable material, back issues, photographs, and so forth. Well, it's kind of like that here, except that in our morgue, these shelves, tables, and file cabinets hold all of our history as a motion picture studio. For here are the drawings, the models, sketches, and background for every film we've ever made. We haven't finished Sleeping Beauty yet, so this section is just beginning. But already, there's over a half million drawings here. In fact, someone once estimated that if all the pencil lines in this room were fancy ribbons, there'd be enough to gift wrap the earth. As the function of the studio grew to include live action films and television, the facilities grew as well. The new studio's Stage 1 had first been used for some of the live-action filming required for Fantasia. Construction on Stage 2 was completed in 1949 for the filming of Jack Webb's brand-new television series, Dragnet. In an unusual arrangement with Walt, Webb actually helped pay for the construction of the stage in exchange for its use. Stage 3, complete with a large water tank, was built specifically to fill a need for the production of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Never one to miss an opportunity, Walt showcased the creation of this film for TV viewers in a program called Operation Undersea, which aired on December 8, 1954. For example, casting the role of Captain Nemo's pet seal, three fine professional performers auditioned for the part. And making a selection called for the utmost tact, we didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Each artiste was poised, well-balanced, and skilled in the arts of pantomime and vocal expression. In the final test, however, the role went to the fair charmer who proved she could handle the part best. Although some industry pundits complained that Walt had delivered an hour-long commercial for his new movie, viewers were fascinated, and the program actually won an Emmy Award for Best Individual Show of the Year. Walt was a great showman, and he knew that whatever he was promoting had to be cushioned in the context of entertainment. When it came time to promote the live-action comedy The Parent Trap in 1961, he barely promoted the film at all. Instead, he took viewers to the studio's title department, introducing Bill Justice, Ex Atencio, and T. Hee, and giving us a primer on stop-motion animation, using The Parent Trap's clever and innovative title sequence as an example. This sequence stars loose-jointed characters like the one on the camera at the moment. As you can plainly see, she's not the traditional rag, a bone, and a hank of hair. Instead, she can trace her ancestry back to such things as wooden spools, pipe cleaners, and empty toothpaste tubes. The eyes move, the head turns, and the arms and legs are changed just the right amount in the right direction between exposures. 
And all of this has to be carefully, delicately done. And if your hand slips, whoops, there perhaps goes a whole day's work. An animation studio had no need for a back lot, but a live action production facility did. The first permanent back lot sets were built in 1957 for the Zorro television series. Most of the buildings collectively known as the Western set were constructed the following year. Once again for television characters, El Fago Baca and Texas John Slaughter. Stage 4 came along in 1958 and was first used for some of the cavernous scenes in Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Again, Walt created a TV program to showcase his ambitious picture, I Capture the King of the Leprechauns, which aired on May 29, 1959. This outstanding program remains one of Walt's cleverest and most entertaining. What's this I hear about him not wanting the gold? Is it a new trick, maybe? No, sir. It's no trick. But it isn't human. I've never heard of a mortal man refusing our gold. It's you I want to see. You see, I'm making a film about Ireland, the real thing. What's that got to do with me? I want you in it. <laughs> Mother and Puff! Is it mad you are man or what? He's wonderful. The gold crown, the red Of course, a studio making live action it. pictures has flesh and blood actors. Walt occasionally showcased his stars in their studio home. But right now we have another story to tell you. The story of how we filmed the great locomotive chase. But animated cartoons, movies, and TV shows weren't the only things Walt made at the studio, and often viewers were treated to some highly unusual actors occupying the Disney sound stages. As live action production expanded, the back lot grew. Residential Street originally consisted of four buildings set up in 1960 for The Absent Minded Professor. A business street came along in 1965 for The Ugly Dachshund and Follow Me Boys. The Disney studio in Burbank continued to evolve over the years, reflecting changes in the entertainment industry. The employees' softball field and later the backlot sets made way for multi-story office buildings. The Disney warehouses fronting the Los Angeles River, on land once considered as a possible site for Disneyland, were raised to build new homes for the feature animation division and the ABC television network. But whatever changes may occur, this will always remain the studio that Walt built, a place he spent a good part of his life creating entertainment magic. And despite all the expansion over the past 60 plus years, the Disney studio retains a charming campus atmosphere that sets it apart from most of its counterparts in Hollywood. So to close our studio tour, here's a real gem from a 1961 Wonderful World of Color program called Backstage Party. It's a one-of-a-kind tour of the Disney Studio lot and shows off the whole place in Walt's grand style. I'll meet you at the studio gate. Hi. Welcome to Disney Studios. We've been expecting you. Walt said to tell you he'd meet you on stage four. Now, uh, this is a big movie lot, but you can't get lost. Just turn left on Mickey Avenue, go past the flagpole, then turn right on Dopey Drive. Continue past the theater to the next corner and make another left-hand turn. From there on, it gets a bit tricky, but you keep right on going till you get to stage four. You can't miss it. Hope you enjoy your visit. If you're looking for stage four, you're a bit off your course. It's down that way. Whoops, <laughs> excuse me. I expect to 
find any traffic way back here. Oh, you must be the folks who are looking for Walt, huh? Well, you won't find him anywhere around here. This is the western set. Officer Riley probably sent you this way, huh? That figures. You know, they don't use this set here just for, for westerns. They, they make all sorts of different... One time we made an eastern. It was way back in the revolutionary days. I told this one fella comes up here driving a herd of horses, right straight through that street, turns over on the other street, and like to knock 12 people down, weren't looking where they were going. <laughs> Once they changed this whole set into a small town, old-fashioned Main Street. Painted all the buildings, that's my work, and uh, changed the names on the stores, and uh, put new costumes, different costumes on the actors, you know. And we had a real circus parade coming right down this street. You folks better get moving if you're going to get over at that party on time. Now, I'll tell you how you get there. You go back there, and you turn right. No. You better back up. And, and turn... No, that won't do you any good either. You go down to the Wells Fargo building, and you turn north, and you go as far... No. Well, to tell you the truth, to get to where you want to go, this is an awful bad place to start from. Tell you what you do. You, you go down here to the old Spanish set, and you cut across that. That's where we shot Zorro. Or I'm mixed up here. That's where they shot the Zorro series. And you can see soundstage number four right from there, and you can't miss it. Now, you run along so you won't be late. Have a real nice time, and I hope to see you there. I, I hope you make it. Sorry you got lost. There's actually a much shorter way to get here. But Officer Riley likes to direct people his way. He calls it the scenic route.